Chapter 4. Neuter Nouns and the Verb to Be, Essie. Chapter 4 covers the following. Second declension neuter nouns, first and second declension adjectives, the nature and use of substantives, the present tense of sum esse, the Latin verb to be, predicate nouns and adjectives, and at the end of the lesson, we'll review the vocabulary you should memorize in this chapter. There are four important rules to remember here. Rule 1. Neuter nominatives and accusative forms are always the same. Rule 2. An adjective agrees with the noun it modifies in number, gender, and case. Rule 3. The base of the Latin verb esse to be is es or sometimes su. And Rule 4. A substantive derives its substance from its gender. Neuter gender. Along with masculine and feminine, Latin also has a neuter gender, meaning neither that is, neither masculine nor feminine. Thus, neuter gender is often applied to things which don't have a natural gender, words like war, bellum, iron, ferrum, or danger, periculum. But it's not as simple as that. There are many exceptions to this rule, and thus in Latin, things which are masculine in gender are not necessarily always male in nature. The same holds true for the other two genders. So in Latin, it's not as straightforward as it is in English, where he, the masculine pronoun, almost always refers to something male, or she, the feminine pronoun, something female, or it, the neuter pronoun, something without gender. In Latin, there are many things which we, English speakers, see as not having natural gender, and so we refer to any of these things in the singular as it. But in Latin, these same things are masculine or feminine. For instance, penalty, poena, is a feminine word. Meal, cana, is also feminine, as is memory, memoria. Book, liber, is masculine. Year, anus, is too, as is grief, dolor. All in all, gender in Latin is arbitrary and must be memorized for each noun. Patterns do exist, however, that can aid in memorizing a word's gender. For instance, first declension nouns, which have short a in their nominative singular, are almost always feminine. In the same way, second declension nouns, ending in us in their nominative singular, are almost always masculine. As we study other declensions and see patterns which can help in memorizing gender, we'll point them out. Second declension neuter nouns. Here are the endings for second declension neuter. Note the nominative singular ending, U-M. In second declension singular, that's the only difference between masculine and neuter forms. In the plural, there are only two differences, the A ending found in the nominative and accusative of the neuter. Happily, then, there is little to memorize here, assuming, of course, you memorize second declension masculine endings. And there is one thing to be very careful of here. The neuter nominative and accusative plural A ending looks a lot like the nominative singular feminine ending in first declension. Confusing these two endings is an easy mistake to make. But because no Latin noun is both first and second declension, these endings do not actually overlap in any way, which just underscores the importance of knowing which declension a Latin noun belongs to. If a noun is first declension and has a short A ending, it means the word is nominative singular. But if a word is second declension neuter and has a short A ending, it can be either nominative or accusative plural. In that light, it's interesting to bear in mind that English derivatives like data and agenda are actually neuter plural. They are derivatives of Latin second declension nouns. Proper grammar then demands that one say, the data show, not the data shows. But enforcing niceties of that sort is often a losing battle. I suggest you use data properly, but do not insist that your friends do. Otherwise, you might find yourself with many data, but few friends. And there's another thing worth noting here. The nominative and accusative forms in the singular and plural respectively are the same. UM in the nominative and accusative singular, 
and a in the nominative and accusative plural, which brings up a rule that will apply not only to all of the forms you learn in Latin, but across Indo-European languages as well, that neuter nominatives and accusatives are always the same. Now, that doesn't mean that the accusative singular and the accusative plural are the same, but within number, in other words, the singular of the nominative and accusative or the plural of the nominative and accusative will always be the same. Here's an example of a second declension neuter noun, bellum, the word that means war. Let's decline it together. Bellum, belly, bello, bellum, bello, bella, bellorum, bellis, bella, bellis. And here's its translation. Note that the cases function the same way they did in first and second declension, so there's no reason to recite them here. Now let's change topic and address adjectives. Adjectives utilize first and second declension endings to create one declensional system called first-second declension. The reason for this is that, since adjectives must be able to modify any noun, they must also be able to take any number, gender, or case. So adjectives have to have a full set of first-second declension endings in order for them to be masculine or feminine or neuter, singular or plural, or any of the case endings. In the world of Latin grammar, nouns take precedence over adjectives. Hence the rule that an adjective must agree with the noun it modifies in number, gender, and case. Now let's look at how to form an adjective. Just like nouns, adjectives have a base. To determine that base, drop the feminine nominative singular ending, in this case a short a, from the second form in the vocabulary. Let's say you have the word magnus, which means great. In the dictionary or your vocabulary list, it will be cited in its nominative singular forms. In this case, magnus, magna, magnum. Take the second form, the feminine nominative singular, drop the ending, the short a, and you have magna, m-a-g-n. That's the base. Let's look at another adjective, weirus, weira, weirum. Drop the ending a from the second form, and you have the base wear, V-E-R. Notice that with both of these adjectives, we could have used the nominative singular masculine form dropping its ending U-S and have gotten the base M-A-G-N or V-E-R. But the reason to use the feminine is because sometimes the masculine nominative singular is irregular, the feminine nominative singular never is. So here's the full declension of another first-second declension adjective, bonus, bona, bonum, meaning good. Let's recite its forms together, moving across the cases, that is, going nominative, singular, masculine, feminine, neuter, then down to the genitive. Bonus, bona, bonum, boni, bonai, boni, bono, bonai, bono. Bonum, bonam, bonum, bono, bona, bono. Notice that as usual we leave the vocative off, although if we did list it, there would be one irregular form, bonne, the vocative masculine singular. Now let's recite the plural together. Boni, bonai, bona, bonorum, bonarum, bonorum, bonis, 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 bonos, bonas, bona, Bonis, bonis, bonis. With all these different forms, it should be clear there's no way to encompass all the information in a Latin adjective in a simple, single English word. With rare exceptions like this and these or that and those, our adjectives do not change form and do not contain the same kind of grammatical information that Latin adjectives do. So either we have to write out the grammar, for instance, if you have the word bonus, you translate it as good, but you need to add the grammatical information nominative singular masculine, or you attach the adjective to a noun with the same grammatical values, as in the good boy did his homework. Hint, hint. And if you think about it, that raises another interesting possibility, namely the formation of what grammarians call substantives. Substantives 
are words that are fundamentally adjectives, but they function as nouns, such as, well, the adjective good again. It can serve as a substantive, that is, as a noun. So, for instance, if you talk about the goods in a store, goods is a noun, meaning the good things in the store, the adjective is serving as a noun, and that's a substantive. Similarly, you can talk about a brave, meaning a Native American warrior. Though brave is fundamentally an adjective, a brave is a person, therefore a noun. Or you can talk about a swift, a fast-flying bird. Birds are nouns, but the word swift is at heart an adjective. In English, we often show that an adjective is functioning as a substantive by pluralizing it or putting an article in front of it, such as electronics or the young and the restless. But Latin adjectives contain more information encoded into them than their English counterparts, which makes them much more naturally easy to convert into substantives because, for instance, they have gender, and gender naturally implies a gendered substance. Hence the principle that Latin substantives derive their substance from their gender. In other words, because a Latin adjective is masculine, it implies that the substance, or the unstated noun lying behind the adjective, is man, or men if the adjective is plural. If an adjective is feminine in gender, it implies woman, or if it's plural, women, and if it's neuter, thing, or things. For an adjective to serve as a substantive, it must have no noun to go with in its sentence. Otherwise, there's no need to evoke substance from its gender. In other words, if bonus has liber to go with it, it's a good book. There's no need to add man to good if you've got book there. So this is how substantives work. You're reading along in a Latin sentence and you come to an adjective. It doesn't have a noun to modify. You look at its gender. If the gender is masculine, you add man or men to the translation of the adjective. If the adjective is feminine, you add woman or women. And if it's neuter, thing or things. Here are some examples of substantives. Say you're reading along in a Latin sentence and you run into the word parwus, meaning small. And as you can see from the U.S. ending, is nominative singular masculine. If there's a noun to attach it to, say puer, you do that. You attach parwus to puer and translate it as small boy. But if there is no noun to attach it to, the Latin text implies man, because parwus is masculine gender. Here's another example. Mala. It means bad. And as you can see from the short A ending, it's nominative singular feminine. If mala is in a sentence where it doesn't have a noun to modify, the implication is a bad woman, and that because it's nominative, it functions as the subject of the sentence. However, the short A on the end of mala allows for another possibility, that mala is functioning as a neuter nominative or accusative plural. In that case, mala means bad things, and most likely serves as either the direct object or subject of the sentence. Here's another example of a substantive, wererum. Weres means true, and the orum on the end of the base shows that the adjective is genitive plural, masculine or neuter. Thus, as a substantive, it would mean of, because it's genitive, true, men, if it's masculine, things if it's neuter, of true men, or of true things. The context of the sentence will dictate which makes better sense. And here's one more final example of a substantive. If people ever ask you to say something in Latin, say this. Stulti, it means stupid. And because you are not among the stulti, you know that it's second declension, genitive singular masculine, or neuter. And so if it doesn't have a noun to modify in its sentence, and thus functions as a substantive, it means of genitive, a stupid, man masculine, or thing neuter. But the I ending can also indicate that it's nominative plural masculine, in which case, it would mean stupid men, and most likely would function as the subject of the sentence. Finally, let's look at one of the most important verbs in Latin, or any language, the verb to be. Like many verbs that are very commonly used, the verb to be in Latin is irregular. Its forms are first-person singular sum, 
second person s, third person est, and in the plural, sumus estes sunt, and the infinitive is esse. These forms translate as follows, sum, I am, s, you are, est, he, she, or it, is, or there is, as in, there is a book you should read, sumus, we are, estes, y'all are, sunt, they are. To be is the translation of the infinitive esse. If you look at this verb linguistically, the base of sum is s. You can see this base in the forms s, est, estis, and esse. However, there is a rule in Latin that if s is followed by a nasal sound, that is, m or n, it becomes su, thus sum, sumus, and sunt. The verb to be is not only unusual in its formation, but also in what grammarians call its expectation. In other words, the forms that accompany it, or that it predicates. The verb to be does not expect a direct object, because direct objects receive action, and there is no action in the verb to be. The technical term for a verb that does not expect a direct object is intransitive, meaning in, not, trans across, it, go, that is, the verb does not carry action across from a subject to a direct object. Instead, with the verb to be, two things are equated. For instance, when you say the man is a teacher, you're essentially saying man equals teacher. So in place of an accusative direct object, Latin sum expects a nominative predicate. In this case, the predicate is nominative because it's being equated with the subject, which is nominative. This is the same general principle we've seen being used with adjectives and appositives, that things which are connected to each other should be in the same case. So to go back to our example, the man is a teacher, man is the subject, and teacher is the predicate. In Latin, this sentence would be, vir est magister where we're is the nominative subject, and magister is the nominative predicate. Predicates can be adjectives as well as nouns, but in either instance, the predicate is nominative. So one can say, puer est parvus, the boy is small, or otium est malum, leisure is evil, or estis boni, y'all are good. Or, if you translate the predicate as a substantive, what we studied before, an adjective functioning as a noun, you could translate it as, y'all are good men, or good people, since masculine gender functions as common gender in Latin. Please note that predicate adjectives agree with the subject in number and gender as well as case, whereas predicate nouns agree with the subject only in case, because nouns have to maintain their own number and gender. Conversely, adjectives must agree with the noun they go with in number, gender, and case. Finally, let's look at the vocabulary for chapter 4. The first word is bellum, belly, neuter, meaning war. It's a second declension neuter noun. The abbreviation N stands for neuter. The genitive singular of neuter nouns in second declension is often abbreviated with the letter I. Thus, bellum, E, neuter. What is the nominative plural of this word? That's right, bella. The next word is cura curai feminine, meaning care, attention, caution, anxiety. It's a first declension feminine noun. Be careful, not all the words in this vocabulary list are second declension neuter. There are words belonging to all sorts of different grammatical categories here, as there will be in all vocabulary lists in Mr. Wheelock's book. Also be careful to note that cura does not mean cure, but care. The Latin word for cure is remedium remedii neuter, from which we get the word remedy. The next word is mora morai feminine, meaning delay. It's another first declension feminine noun. Be careful with this word. Even though it resembles English words like mortal and mortify, it doesn't mean death. It means delay. If you know the word moratorium, meaning delay usually in some sort of practice, such as a moratorium on whale hunting, 
That will help you remember that mora means delay. If you don't know the word moratorium, well, learn it. The next word is nihil, meaning nothing. It is neuter. We can tell that from the adjectives that are attached to it occasionally. But it is an unusual word because it normally does not decline. That is, it doesn't change its form as it changes its function in the sentence. However, some Roman authors do decline this word, and when they do, it goes nihil, nihili, nihilo, nihilum, nihilo. But even those authors do not make a plural. Zero plus zero is never anything more than zero. The next word is oculus, oculi, masculine, meaning I. It's a second declension masculine noun. What would the nominative plural of this word be? That's right, oculi. The next word is periculum, periculi, neuter, meaning danger. It's a second declension neuter noun. What would the nominative plural of this word be? That's right, pericula. The next five words in your vocabulary are all adjectives. The first is bonus, bona, bonum, meaning good or kind. It's a first second declension adjective. One slash two is the abbreviation that's used to indicate that the adjective belongs to that category. This designation applies to all adjectives that we have studied so far. Later in the class, we'll learn there's another type of adjective, but that's it. There are only two categories of adjectives in Latin. The next word is malus, mala, malum, meaning bad, evil, wicked. It's also for second declension. The abbreviation us, a, um is the way vocabulary lists and Latin dictionaries will indicate that an adjective belongs to this particular declensional system, the first second. The next word, parvus a um, means small or little. It's also a first second declension adjective. The next word is stultus a um, meaning foolish or stupid. It also belongs to first second declension. And finally, Verus a um means true or real. It is also first second declension. The next item in the vocabulary is the verb sum esse, the Latin verb meaning to be. It is irregular, as we discussed above. The word after that, magister, magistri, masculine, means teacher. It's second declension masculine. The T-R-I after the nominative singular in the vocabulary indicates that the base of this word contracts. That base is spelled M-A-G-I-S-T-R. Unlike the nominative singular, it has no E. You should note also that there's a feminine form of this base, magistra, magistri, feminine, a first declension feminine noun. It means a teacher who is a woman. The next word is otium, ote, neuter, meaning leisure or peace. This word means peace in the sense of peace and quiet, not peace as in peace and war. Later in the class, we'll learn the word that means peace as opposed to war. The letters ii cited in the vocabulary after the nominative singular signal two things. The second i represents the genitive singular, indicating that the word is second declension, and the first I is a reminder that the base of this word ends with the letter I. So the double I in the vocabulary is really just a reminder that the genitive singular of this word will have two I's. In that light, what is the dative or ablative plural form of this word? That's right, O-T-E-S. And the last word in this vocabulary is one more adjective. Bellus a um, meaning pretty, handsome, charming. It's a first second declension adjective. Please note that this is an adjective, not a noun. Although this adjective has the same base as the noun bellum, belly, neuter, meaning war, they are completely different words, homonyms in fact, words that by chance have come to look like each other, but do not come from the same root or origin.
So let's translate a sentence using both of these words. Bellum non est bellum. What does that sentence mean? That's right. War is not pretty. Or if you interpret the predicate adjective as a substantive, war is not a pretty thing. So, do the rules that were cited at the beginning of this chapter now make sense to you? If not, please review this presentation. If so, please proceed to the next slide. For the next class exercise, Please print out a copy of the Practice and Review Sentences for Chapter 4 on page 21 of Wheelock. And that's it for Chapter 4. Study hard, Odiscipuli. As we said before, Otium est malum.